So, where are we? Here we go. I was speaking to Anushka from KPN about this earlier on today. There's always a real danger at this time of the agenda that you feel like that best man at a wedding. You've been sitting there all day, you haven't been drinking, you're waiting for waiting to use your best lines, and the father of the bride stands up and he cracks every gag you're about to give. So I've been sitting there all day going, oh, you weren't meant to be funny, please be quiet. And it, was all, it started off with your panel earlier on, Roland, talking about, and it broke off into partnering. I'm thinking, oh, God, that's half my story gone. But we're here. So I also heard from, um, from Andy when he was talking about his session, don't talk about the company. Don't, you know, people aren't interested. And I thought, bullshit. We have been on a fantastic journey at Bonage, and I wanted to go back to that history thing that he spoke about. Um, because we, we spoke about uh, one of the earliest CPAS businesses going, um, which was, uh, it's not Bix anymore, Tele, Telesign. And Stacey was saying, yeah, 2005, I think they were funded. I actually think there was one before that. And if anybody remembers Ribbit, Ribbit was, I think, pipped them by a couple of months, and they were bought for 105 million by BT in 2011 or something like that. That went fabulously well for them. Um, but Vonage, the story from Vonage goes back, back to 2001. So in 2001, we appeared in the market, and I promise you I wasn't there then. But in 2001, we, we, we turned up as a voice over IP service for consumers. And that was hugely innovative at its time, because it meant that those in the US could tear up their contracts with AT&T. They didn't have to pay for their phone lines anymore. They could just use all the uh, IP for their, phone, their consumer phone, which was, as I say, massively innovative. And for 10 years, it was brilliant. By sort of 2010, 2011, the writing was on the wall. That started to plateau off, and the business realized we had to do something. And we had to change from this consumer business. So we started investing the cash that this consumer business was spitting off for fun into a, a, a transformative direction for the company. We were moving down the path now to, away from consumer to becoming business. And we spent a load of cash on Broadsoft businesses at that point in time. And gradually over the years, we got to what I think is the most important acquisition of the lot, which was the acquisition of Nexmo. And to that, we added as well, on top of that, we then added the acquisition of Talkbox, and we added, most latterly, the um, acquisition of New Voice Media. So if you go back to, to uh, Andy's history earlier on, we've got virtually every one of those acronyms covered. We've got the CCAS, we've got the CPAS, we've got the, um, uh, and the UCAS as well up there, and a whole load of other stuff in the middle. But it's meant that we've actually gone from being a consumer business to now, this year, we'll be heading to the point where APIs will be driving the vast majority of the revenue for a 1.2 billion turnover business. So if you ever wondered you know, how important this stuff is, that's a hell of a turnaround. It's a market that's growing 50% year on year. And we did that by spending one point something billion over the, over the years. But as I say, we've still got half a billion of, of business coming from that consumer stuff, which is gonna fuel that future growth. So that's the, that's the business pitch. That was, that, was, that was really just talking about the fact we've lived that entire history all the way through. There we go. And that, so then when I was asked, with all this weight of innovation and history in Vonage, I said, Mark, come and build a partner strategy. We need one. We haven't got one. And I was thinking, well, this is awesome. Piece of blank piece of paper. I can start wherever I want. I can do something different. I can be a punk. And different was what we had to do. And I, and I looked at what was out in the market, and this warehouse conundrum sort of hit me. And it's not a Netflix release, although I thought the one from Twilio, what was it, the program, program, programmability continuum, I thought that must have been from Netflix. But the, the, the warehouse conundrum was this challenge, of, well, what does a partner model look like? More importantly, what does a channel model look like? Because that's what they all were right then. And I hate the word channel. Channel means I sell to you, you sell to them. That's not a relationship, that's a route to market. And this is what the warehouse problem was. Every single partner model out there was we would sell a thousand boxes to you, you'd sell a hundred boxes to ten resellers, they'd sell to a bunch of customers. That works perfectly if every single box is exactly the same. In reality, in a CPAS world, one second I'm talking about improving safety and security for riders in a ride hailing service, the next minute we're talking about telemedicine, you know, whether it's skin care or whether it's mental health problems we're solving with, with video over um, t telehealth over video. The next one, it's about mortgage applications. You know, all these conversations we've had over coffee today, not one of them is the same. You know, every time I see Mark from IDC, we have the same conversation about different use cases. And these are the things that make it really interesting for me. Otherwise, we are just talking about technology. And in the CPAS world, all these things are so different. So we can't address this with a warehouse problem or a warehouse solution. We've got to look differently. And I think we are in the, the, economy, the experience economy now. 
I don't think anybody in this room can disagree with that. And if you do, you may as well go to the bar now, because I think you're in the wrong conference. But we are in a space right now where every single business needs to be investing massively in their customer experience. That's not new news, though. If you go back um, all about to 2000, and there was a report done that tracked the, the, uh, the, the performance of the American Consumer Satisfaction Index, which is the top 400 um, brands by customer satisfaction. And you track their performance over the last, in this case, it was six years or seven years up to about 2017. Um, there it is, that one. Um, and up to 2017, and map that against the Standard & Poor 500, and it outperformed the S&P 500 by a factor of five in terms of, of stock value growth. So customer satisfaction has been driving value in companies for much more than you know, the last year or two. This goes all the way back to 2000. If you look more recently, some work we've been doing with um, a UK um, consultancy company, I mean, I'm sure you probably know the, the name Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton have a practice based on uh, financial service advisory around digital transformation. So they make money when somebody wants to drop some technology in and they have to do all the process re-engineering. Equally, you know, from our perspective, it's great because we drop technology and somebody's got to reprogram the business process, so it works perfectly for us. They run this um, customer loyalty and engagement index every year, and this is last year's. Uh, this year's is, is out in, um, in about a month's time. And they surveyed, I think it's 24,000 customers of a number of big UK financial services brands, but also mapped them to big brands in retail as well. I mean, there's no reason why, if you're talking about customer experience, I should only benchmark myself against my immediate competitor, I should benchmark myself against the best in the industry. So they started looking at other, other, other industries. And one of the things that they, they saw, well, firstly, there's a massive co correlation between uh, customer loyalty uh, and customer experience. And that's fairly obvious. So we all know the benefits of that in terms of you know, it's, it's cheaper to keep a customer than it is to acquire a customer. Um, but some of the stuff that's really interesting, and Adrian, I think you talked about Coventry in, in your presentation earlier on. Hard to tell from the colour scheme there, but if you look at the building societies, which are the purple ones, most of them are down the bottom left here. There's a couple of outliers, and I, I guess that Coventry is probably one of the ones at the top there. Uh, if you look at particular industries, though, investment management and general insurance, and general, mostly all the building societies, are way down bottom left. And it doesn't surprise me. I, I mean, I went to one of the... Yeah, giving away names. I won't give the name away. For those that know the U UK market, you may get there. But I went to speak to one of the, the UK building societies, and there's three of them in the same rough area of the country. And I said, who's your competition? I said, well, our competition's one of the, the other two that are in the same, same county. These businesses are headquartered no more than 40 miles from each other. You know, they're a, a nationwide building society. They weren't the one, just in case you thought it was. Um, and they, the only competition they could see was the ones 40 miles up the road. That's not how you benchmark your customer experience. You should be thinking about the best ones out there um, for delivering customer experience. I mean, who, who are they? You, you all engage with consumer brands day in, day out. If I said to you, who gives you the best experience? It's going to be someone like this. One of these brands is up there. And you've got to add a few more. Lyft we've spoken about. Uh, there's tons of these that set the bar. And they set the bar because they're so easy to engage with. They are personal, they know who you are. There is context, they know what you're calling about, when you're calling about it, where you are. You then say, well, how far can I take this? And again, we were talking about creepy earlier on as, as, one, of the, uh, as one of the sort of tests of how, you, how far you take your data. Starbucks do this test called cool or creepy. Every time they have this new sort of set of data and they work out how to apply it, they say, that's great, Roland's coming into the room, into the, into the building. We spotted him on a beacon already. We know where he is. We know by the temperature of, the, um, the, the, of today that he normally orders a cappuccino and a croissant. We know what he looks like, so the, so the barista is going to shout down the line, usual? Try it out. Is that cool or is that creepy? And this, but this personalization and context is stuff that all of these brands are, are excelling in. And this is where we should be benchmarking um, yourselves against. And then if you look to Mark's data, and I knew Mark was presenting today, so oh, tomorrow in fact, so I pulled this one up, because this one actually fed a lot of my own personal strategy and thinking around the market. So in 2017, 2018, Mark produced the, uh, his CPAS analysis on the growth, uh, the revenue growth of it. And it was great to see that in 2018, he actually doubled down on the same numbers and kicked them up a bit steeper. But the really key thing was, around 2017, 2018, there was a subtle change in where that growth was coming from. That growth was no longer coming from digital natives, cloud natives. It wasn't coming from those four type of brands that were on the last slide. 
It was coming from SaaS providers, ISVs. It was coming from system integrators, dev agencies. Basically, it was coming from an indirect route to market. So if you dig into that, what does that mean? That means the people are now buying CPaaS. So this was end of, last, end of, 2018, end of 2017. Sorry. The people are now buying CPaaS are the enterprise buyers. They were the ones that are now saying, hey, I've been disrupted. You know, the blockbuster to the Netflix, possibly, although they didn't re react quite quick enough. They've been disrupted by traditional, by, by, the, by the traditional businesses have been disrupted by the, digi by the digital natives. So they're starting to fight back. The big difference is that digital natives are tech companies. They can play with APIs, they can develop on APIs, they have busfuls of developers. You go to your average hotel chain and say, well, you want to recreate what Airbnb have done in terms of ease of use. How many developers have you got? Mm, three. <laughs> okay, you're not getting very far. So they want to buy these package solutions. They want to move towards solutions, not just APIs. So that was the market trend. So you've got everybody wants to invest in customer experience. You've got people's businesses being disrupted. And you've now got the fact the enterprise buyer represents a different profile of who we're selling to. So again, that, that all fed my thinking about that. So I went to the leadership team at Nexmo. And I said, well, the first thing we're going to do is kill this old-fashioned, traditional, bronze, silver, gold BS around certifications and hierarchies. And that's great. Have you seen our UCAS channel model with bronze, silver, gold? <laughs> anyway, they, well, they got over that one eventually. Uh, but uh, this is a whole different reflection in that right now, I think Andy from, um, uh, sorry, no, it was David um, from Avaya this morning said, there's no single vendor can do it all. You know, he, he needs other people. I, I, I would say that in lots of cases, there are lots of people involved in every single use case. It's not just about one person partnering with somebody else. It could be, uh, it could be that it could be multiple people, multiple partners, all involved in the same use case. And I'll come on to an example of that in a moment. But this just shows you that this whole traditional warehouse model just does not work. It's not about me sh shipping that box anymore. I need to find loads of people to help me sell to the enterprise, because at the end of the day, I've got an API platform. The enterprise doesn't want an API platform. The enterprise wants a room booking system for a hotel chain, or they want a telemedicine system um, to, to use in the NHS in the UK. You know, they don't want APIs. So this model is broken. The warehouse can be solved, just kill it. It is no longer relevant to the world of CPAS. And if you want a really good example of that, let's look at something like uh, logistics. We have a load of customers in logistics. And the, the most obvious use case that you're, you're automating or changing, improving around customer experience is the one that used to be, where's my bloody parcel? I've been waiting at home for it all day. Still hasn't turned up. I'm taking a day off work. We've all been there. Over time, that's improved. First, it was voice bots. Then it was chatbots. Now you get the option of the two. But a lot of the logistics companies are still going through that evolution. And in those cases, let's look at what's involved. Somebody should be really in there preparing the data set if there's machine learning involved. Someone else is integrating into the voice channel. Who's providing the SIP trunk? What about the chatbot? What about a visual configurator? Am I going to use a bot? So am I going to use a person to, to, to write that? Am I going to uh, visually configure it to the studio? Is someone really going to code it all? There's so many different people who could be involved in that simple process of automate where's my parcel. The payback's massive. One of our customers replaced 75% 75 of the people in their call centers by just moving from phone call base to a, a voice bot. And the customer experience is awesome. You don't have to have that phone call. You can see where it is, just like the Domino's example Roland gave earlier. You know where, you, where your parcel is. But in that model, again, that means we need lots of partners involved in that. So we continue. We continue to actually market to the end customer, but we actually have to put the partner at the center of what we do. And if you unpeel this onion from the very center here, the partner sits right in there, right in the center. And if we take a view that a partner is not a channel to market, is not a, a warehouse, that a partner is actually a fundamental part of our product strategy, then you understand how we fill that gap between us being an API platform and the customer wanting to buy a solution. So at the core, we start building out tools that make it easy for the, the customers to, the, the partners, sorry, to use our platform. And it's stuff like account management, how, to, how they can look after not only their account, but their customers' accounts as well. Sounds simple, but most API platforms were built in the first place based upon the principle that the only people we sell to are developers. 
So when we move from that to selling to somebody who's selling to somebody else, then the whole model has to change. You start building connectors to other systems because people want that friction taken out of integration. You start building sample code. And then you think about, actually, what, are, what do we sell on top of that? What are things that we can now effectively promote as products of our own, but they're provided by partners? So whether that be bots, whether it be contact center services, um, email APIs, there's stuff like that that we can now go out to market. They're actually partner-built. They're just part of our ecosystem. So you can start to see we're now putting value back into the partners. We're not just enabling them. And then you scale out again, the next layer of the onion, you get to uh, all those pieces that are reusable in lots of different ways, whether it be an iPass provider, whether they be a bot provider, AI, you've got machine learning, there's translation, transcription. Um, I was speaking to somebody in the, uh, outside earlier on who has a text-to-speech engine in niche languages, things like Flemish, for example. Now, I'm sure it's not that niche, but not in this audience anyway, but trying to get bots that understand Flemish is actually relatively scarce. So to find a partner that we can work with that brings that in, then we have an extra capability inside our stack when we talk to our own customers in Belgium, obviously. Um, and then after that, you get into the orange layer. So you're now talking about built services. So you're talking about SaaS providers who have built stuff on our platform. Somebody comes to us and says, well, no, which, SaaS, which, which CRM as a service platforms do you work with? Because we'd really like to be able to alert our, um, uh, our customers via ticket closures, uh, via SMS or WhatsApp or whatever it may be. Well, we can say, we've got Freshworks, we've got Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. So now you've got people who have built apps using our tools upon our platform to address an end customer that's an enterprise buyer. So then you keep scaling out, and, you, and what you actually find yourself doing is, We've actually built a platform, an ecosystem, whereby partners work with each other and find value from each other's capabilities. We then you know, work with, in, with the system integrators, the dev agencies, um, we work with marketplaces. We, we, in, in the opening, Adrian talked about marketplaces, you know, the KPN App Store, um, or the API Store, sorry, we, we sit on there as well. So the customers come in, they think, okay, well, how am I going to procure this? Then what are the pieces we can procure? And then have we made it easy for those businesses to build those pieces that they're going to procure? And the whole ecosystem then becomes something that is a long, long way away from that warehouse conundrum that we had in the first place. And we've moved to something which is very much partner-centric. We're promoting our partners to our end customers. The, the value is in that ecosystem, and those that are in there are getting value from being inside the circle. Ultimately, we benefit, because we've got a platform that people are using for SMS, for voice, for video, etc. But it means we don't have to scale up vertically. We don't have to build our software as a service vertically to address this market either. We've got hundreds of partners who can each address a vertical of their own and pull in other partners so between them, have a much richer way of taking us to market. And that's the best way we can find, from starting from an old-fashioned old channel model to coming to a partner ecosystem, and to make money not just for us, but for all of our partners who are in there as well. So, two minutes early. Thank you very much. A lot of our work we do in the Dutch marketplace goes through KPN. We've got, pop, got technology partners in there. Off the top of my head, I'd have to, I couldn't give you the exact numbers. But there's a, there's a blend of um, SaaS businesses as well as technology partners. So, you could get a very niche tech startup, um, where is Surfly, for example, who specialize in, um, uh, they do co-browsing. So there's somebody, if, if someone's working on our top box platform and want co-browsing, we haven't built it, we don't want to build it. Somebody has, they partnered, so we'll point that customer to, to Surfly to work with our platform. Uh, there's another partner called Contexta, um, who do, they've got a very rich uh, sort of lexicon of speech to text um, uh, software, oh, sorry, a very, Speech tech software, but they use some very rich lexicons. They're very industry specific. So if they're used in healthcare, for example, they, they actually understand medical names. Partner with those guys as well. So they're another Dutch partner we have. And I think Andy White is the chief executive speaking tomorrow.